The show begins in a nice suburban neighborhood where Dan and his family are hosting a Christmas party. Dan is a high school biology teacher who used to serve in the military. He is seen on the phone trying to get a new job but he didn't manage to get it. Feeling dejected, he sits down to watch the World Cup finals on TV with his daughter, Murray, and his wife, Emmy. He tells them that he's meant to do something special with his life. Suddenly, there's a huge blast of light on the football pitch and a group of soldiers comes through it. The leader, called Hart, announces that they come from the future, 30 years later. In that future, humans are fighting a losing war against alien monsters and will be wiped out 11 months in. Because of that, they are recruiting people to help them in the war. Soon, jump facilities are established around the world to send military troops into the future to fight the monsters, called White Spikes. The survival rate turns out to be very low and not everyone has the capability to survive these jumps. In desperation, civilians are also being drafted. Thousands of people are being sent every week but the estimated future population is still below 500,000. After a while, people begin to doubt this plan and protests become widespread. Even Dan's daughter, Murray, has a bad dream that Dan has been drafted in the war. Dan still teaches high school biology as usual but his students see no point in studying because humanity is losing the war and will be wiped out in the future anyway. Dan tells them that science is the solution so they should focus on studying it. He then gets a draft notice on his phone. He reports to the draft center and undergoes a test to see if he's qualified. He's also notified that in the event of his death, his dependents will be given $1 million. After a scan, which shows that he will die in 7 years time in 2030, he is deemed qualified. Dan wants to know how he'll die but they won't tell him. He is then equipped with a jump band to let him jump into the future, but the band also allows him to be tracked so that he won't be able to dodge his draft. In the next scene, Emmy is seen hosting a group therapy session for draftees, who have survived seven days of war in the future. Most of them appear to have lost limbs and are equipped with prosthetics. Apparently, only 30% of draftees manage to return home. After Dan tells Emmy about his draft, she tries to convince him to run away together as a family. Dan says it's not possible but Emmy then asks him to get help from his dad, who he resents. Dan goes to find his dad, James, in a hangar, who is about to help him remove the jump band from his wrist but they got into an argument. James is also a war veteran but left Dan and his mom because he couldn't overcome his PTSD and was dangerous to them. Dan calls him a coward and leaves without his help. Dan goes home to Emmy and Murray and tells them he'll be going to the war for seven days but he'll be back. At the center, Dan is debriefed and placed in a group. They're told that upon surviving seven days in the future, they'll be automatically jumped back to the present time. Dan also becomes friends with a science geek in his group, called Charlie. Charlie points out that they have a guy, Dorian, who has survived two jumps in Russia and is going in for his third. Dorian wears a claw around his neck, which supposedly belonged to one of the first white spikes ever killed. They also notice that the group consists mostly of older people, because they would have to be dead in the time they're jumping too. This is to avoid a paradox where they would meet their future selves. Dan's group will be jumped to a Miami research facility where they'll aid the people there. As Dan is taking a rest along with the others, suddenly an alarm blares and they're told they'll be deployed immediately ahead of the planned schedule. Apparently, the research lab in the future is under attack and it's the last one standing. Dan gathers at the launch point and just as he's jumping, an error occurs which changes the output coordinates. Dan is seen falling from the sky high above ruined buildings with many others. Most of them die immediately after landing on hard ground. Dan and a small group of lucky survivors land into a rooftop pool. The scene is desolate and the white spikes can be heard screeching in the distance. Using their binoculars, the survivors witness a group of people getting killed in a split second by the white spikes. Soon, Dan's group is contacted by the commander over radio. They are tasked with rescuing a research team that is stranded in a lab nearby. Since Dan has the most military experience, he leads the group down onto the streets. They manage to make their way to the lab but finds that the research team has been killed by the white spikes. The commander tells them to retrieve some ampules instead. After finding those ampules, Dan is told that a bombing run is about to start and they need to get out quickly. On their way out through the stairwell, they encounter a group of white spikes, which runs at them while shooting spikes from their tails. Dan's group suffers a few casualties as they make their way down the stairs. Dan tries to slow down a white spike that's chasing them and with Dorian's help, manages to take it down. They escape the building and run towards the extraction team that's speeding towards them. However, the extraction team gets taken out by a few white spikes and more begin to gather. The bomber planes drop the bombs which kill all the white spikes chasing Dan's group, knocking Dan out in the process. Dan wakes up in an army base in Dominican Republic. He finds out that only Dorian, Charlie and himself have survived. Also, Dorian reveals the reason for his war-hungry behavior. He only has six months to live due to cancer, so he wants to die fighting. Dorian and Charlie will be redeployed elsewhere while Dan is instructed to meet the commander. The commander turns out to be Murray, Dan's daughter, 30 years into the future. 
She's very brilliant. Besides being a colonel, she's also the lead researcher and graduated from MIT with a PhD in biotechnology. However, she seems distant and refuses to hug Dan. Murray then briefs Dan on their next mission, which is to extract a rare female white spike from its nest. Female white spikes breed underground and are heavily protected by the males. The females can't be killed by the usual toxin, and Murray wants to catch one to find out how to kill them. On their way to the nest, Murray tells Dan about the white spikes history. Undetected, they just started showing up in Russia one day, before driving human life to extinction in just three years. Dan then asks Murray about himself, and what happened in the past. Murray says that the less he knows, the better. They reach the nest and the army seems to have cornered the female white spike. Despite being tranquilized, the white spike still proves to be very strong. It starts tearing up the extraction team. Murray tells Dan to stay in the chopper while she jumps into the nest herself. Murray shoots one of its limbs, which makes it attack Murray. Outside the nest, Dan spots a group of white spikes heading towards them. He jumps into the nest to help. With his help, they manage to cage the female white spike. Just as the chopper pulls the cage out of the nest, the entire area gets swarmed by white spikes. Dan and Murray manage to get into a Humvee and narrowly escape to a beach. Murray fires off a flare. While waiting, Murray reveals to Dan that he was unhappy with his life in the past. He divorced Emmy and left both of them. One day, Murray got a call from the hospital and was told that Dan was in a car accident. She witnessed his death in the ICU. Later, a chopper appears to pick them up. They are transported to a fortified oil rig, which has been turned into a makeshift base, in the middle of the ocean. Murray and Dan run tests on the female white spike to discover a toxin that can kill it. They start to bond as they spend time together. Later, she reveals her grand plan and the reason why she brought Dan to her timeline. She knows that there never will be enough time and resources in her timeline to mass produce the toxin. Dan's purpose is to bring the toxin back to the past instead and use it to prevent the war from happening in the first place while Murray dies with humanity in her timeline. The tests are successful and the female white spike notices this. It screeches out and a ton of white spikes start coming. Apparently, they're able to swim too. Despite the extensive minefields and defenses all around the base, the white spikes keep coming. Dan and Murray start heading towards the jump link. The female white spike is freed by other white spikes and it goes to hunt Dan and Murray. Halfway there, Miri gets hit in the back by a spike and she falls to the ground. Dan pulls her up and helps her move, but soon the base is overrun. Miri is also hurt really bad and is unable to move. Miri passes the toxin to Dan, who refuses to leave her. Suddenly, the female white spike appears and claws at Miri. The platform thereon crumbles and the white spike drags Miri down with it while Dan tries to hold onto her. Knowing she's doomed, she lets go of Dan's hand and falls into the swarm of white spikes below. Dan throws himself after her, which triggers his jump and he's transported back to the present timeline where he loses consciousness. When he wakes up, he sees Hart and tells her to mass produce the toxin and send them back to the future but Hart tells him that the jump link has gone offline, presumably destroyed. Devastated, Dan heads back home with Emmy and sees little Miri and hugs her. At night, Dan tells Emmy about the future and how he met Miri there. Also, he has the toxin with him but has no idea how to use it to prevent the war from happening because in the future, they couldn't find any alien ships even with satellites. Emmy suggests that the white spikes might have been landed on Earth long before they finally showed themselves, which triggers an idea. Later, Dan finds Dorian, who's drinking in a bar. Dan manages to convince Dorian to help him with his plan. They meet with Charlie, who analyzes the claw that Dan wears around his neck. Charlie says that the claw has volcanic ash on it, which originates from China and not Russia. Coincidentally, Dan has a student who is obsessed with volcanoes and they seek him out for advice. The student says that it's possible that a huge volcanic eruption caused ash to blow from China all the way to Russia, but this event happened over a thousand years ago. This means that the white spikes have landed on Earth more than a thousand years ago and that is how they remained undetected. Upon further analysis, they concluded that the white spikes were actually stuck deep inside Russia's glacier all this time, and only managed to thaw out from the polar ice melt by 2048. Dan's team reports these findings to the US Secretary of Defense. However, he denies them since they lack proof and resources due to the panic and protests. As a last resort, Dan goes to find his dad, James, who owns a plane, and he agrees to help. Dan also secures the help of Hart and her group of soldiers. Together, they land in Russia's Glacier Island and splits up to look for signs of an alien spaceship. After some time, their gauges and sensors start acting up, which means they're close. Using some explosives, they open up a fissure which leads into a cave. Deep into the cave, they finally find the frozen spaceship. At first, they consider taking some photographs and convincing the world to help them destroy the ship and its inhabitants. However, they decide that the UN or world leaders will likely take too long to talk and negotiate over it. James and Charlie stay outside the ship to stop any white spikes from escaping, while the others cut a hole in the spaceship and head inside. 
They discover the cockpit, which were manned by several frozen alien beings, not the white spikes. Deeper inside, they come across cocoon-like structures with white spikes inside them. It appears that the white spikes were just cargo for these aliens, whether used for breeding or as weapons, nobody knows for sure. Dan and his team inject the toxin into some of the cocoons. The white spikes inside start screeching and dying. However, more white spikes start waking up and breaking out of the cocoons. Some white spikes manage to escape the room. Dorian, along with a few others, volunteer to stay behind just in case they need to manually blow up the ship from inside. Dorian passes his claw necklace to Dan as a keepsake. Dan leaves the ship to chase after the white spikes. Things get hectic inside the ship and Hart discovers a whole colony of white spikes inside. Knowing it's impossible to contain all of them with just bullets, Dorian blows up the ship. Dan finds James and Charlie further outside where they have killed a white spike, but James says one other female white spike has escaped. Dan and James split up to find the last white spike. James uses a decoy to lower it before shooting it with a sniper rifle. Despite many direct hits however, the white spike still stands strong and runs towards James. Dan drives his snowmobile into the white spike and begins shooting it together with James. However, the white spike manages to slip away in the dense snowstorm. In a back-to-back -back formation, Dan and James stand their ground. The white spike suddenly lunges at them, knocking them off their feet. Dan gets shot in the leg by a spike and he falls over. The white spike charges at Dan, who knives it in the left eye. James runs over with an ice pick and gouges out its right eye. Blinded, the white spike starts shooting its spikes randomly. Dan takes advantage of this and injects one of its limbs with the toxin, which starts to disintegrate the limb. The white spike bites down on its limb and tears it off to stop the spreading toxin. Although it's blind, the white spike starts flailing in Dan's direction. James cuts his palm with a knife to lure the white spike because it can detect blood too. As the white spike rushes towards James, he tells Dan that he's sorry for everything. Right as the white spike is about to reach James, Dan jumps onto the white spike and with a claw keepsake given by Dorian, he slices its throat. Then, he takes out another toxin capsule and injects it into the white spike's mouth. The white spike starts disintegrating, falls off the cliff and is smashed into pieces. In the next scene, their success is being reported on TV news, and the US Secretary of Defense is seen trying to take credit for it. Dan goes home to see his family, this time together with his dad. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications and leave a like.